this exchange-free economics or this interchange economics idea based on abundance versus artificial scarcity really is the uh, the keystone to all the other ideas that I plan to present in more bite-sized, five-minute fashion. I'll start off by just outlining my thesis briefly. Um, it, it's, it's basically this. It's the inadequate tool of money. Really that it's a tool that's inadequate when it's not equal to the inadequate tool, which is inherent in both capitalism uh, and socialism, both of them. Communists, you know, they, Russians have been equal. They use money. So this is not socialism or communism. I believe that, that money inhibits where capitalism inhibits true free enterprise. And this is not a, really a new idea. Uh, Thorstein Bevelin, the American economist at the turn of the century, <coughs> from this concept thereabouts, and uh, he took on to capitalism and socialism, but he didn't really provide an alternative um, to replace either of them. And that's what I think I'm doing. And now, you might, some people might confuse this at first with, with Marxism or with socialism, but really what I did is I, I borrowed this structure of economics and the study of history of the class conflict. I think it's on something there. But see if you see the difference. I just sort of add to his, uh, his dictum. And this is my, my, my addition. Uh, from each according to his or her interest and ability. We can talk about interest and ability. To each according to his or her desire. And he, <coughs> Marx would talk about desire as well, about whatever you're good at, you do it for the state. So I add those two things in. I think that's what true free enterprise really is. And capitalists say that that's what they do, and they're you know, capitalists, but I think they, I'll try to demonstrate today why I think they hold, uh, what capitalists hold, a true free enterprise uh, back. Um, I'm also going to talk about uh, why I'm pro consumption. Uh, a lot of people or anti-capitalist or anti-consumption. I'm pro-consumption. I think you can do that if you uh, temper it with mass recycling, which is stopped because you have, uh, it's, it's hard for, uh, it's cheaper to just make more materials than to buy recycled materials. So that's the result of the, that's the following of the capitalist system. I'm also going to talk about uh, Buckminster Fuller's, you know, Buckminster Fuller, the round scientist, and under his proposal of a global electric grid powered by renewable energy sources. We'll talk about, a little bit about that. Um, also, I'll mention uh, edu why education should be uh, provided by libraries. I'm also going to talk about the WTO and why, uh, and why education is not, is not made a priority. What the, the problem, why we have to make priorities. I, I, my, I think the economic system uh, should, we have, should have an economic system that, where we do not have to make priorities. And I'm fixing with the, with the consumption. Um, and lastly, I'll talk about uh, the United States, or really what I mean by the United States of Earth, really, more specifically, is the United Bioregions of Earth. Um, I think the unit we have all that was the, the unit towards workable. We can't have 180 countries. And really, some of these countries really aren't countries, they're sort of puppets, or extensions of, uh, of European colonials, as far as I can tell. So if we have if we have fire regions, we we don't belong in the uh, uh, Great Lakes region. We we represent it in maybe a unique capital percent, perhaps. Um, and the Australian outback and the Chesapeake Bay. So we have small fire regions and large fire regions. I think we, that'd be the basis for it. And also, we would, we would create um, what I call a new synergy. I talk about reconnecting with our all of our indigenous cultural heritage as human beings. And uh, you know, some of you don't study history, just realize we're two miles north of where Tecumseh uh, was born and started his, his life. And, uh, you know, just think about the head to head. If Europeans listen to Tecumseh, what kind of world would we have if we would respect the earth um, you know, and live with it? And, and have consumption based on that, and have synergy between that, those kind of values, indigenous values, and some of the more European, perhaps, exploration or scientific mindset. So that was a missed opportunity. Um, 
So I, I, I try to like rekindle uh, some of the ideas that come to But why does why does capitalism not work? Um, I believe it's because we don't really have health competition, or, or we're not able to market quality goods and services. You look at uh, a few examples, like if you use the tuberculosis, TB, tuber tuberculosis um, vaccine, or if we have we saw a documentary where we didn't make, uh, we haven't made any advances in tuberculosis research in, in, like, in the last 20 years. It's a lot of advances. Why is that? Because poor countries, people who have TB are in poor countries. And they can't really afford drugs from the from the from the service. So you have people we have scientists, my dad uh, was he's a doctor, he's an inventor. He he suffered from tuberculosis and he wanted to make a contribution, trying to work with the World Health Organization, trying to make some different kind of needles that would make the uh, injection of TB medicine more widely available and, and he talks to people like Mark and all these corporations and they don't um, they're like, well it's not really money here, so we're not gonna we're gonna stop we're not going to take your ideas. And let all these poor people die. So um, that's that's an example. Parkinson's research here in this country. You know, my, it, here, here again. Why do we have to make my priorities of what you know? AIDS and cancer. They have to be the priorities. That's fine. But what about all the other diseases like, like Parkinson's? And you, know, you have to have like Michael J. Fox, you know, the actor, Back to the Future. He has to go to Congress and basically beg Congress for a, a research fund because. We can't do it all the way capitalism is set up. It's based on scarcity. It's kind of like eight musical shares. It, it, it functions. And, um, but it, it, it's kind of like, it's free, but everybody's sort of like free to clamor after uh, in, uh, sometimes expanding pie or you know, retracting pie. And, and socialism just doesn't work because they just take a, a scarce pie and buy it up equally, and everybody has to look just a little bit. So, you know, no, either approach is going to work. Uh, cars that there's a fella here in uh, Grove City, here near Columbus, who want, has, <coughs> knows how to make cars that run on, on water. They show up. You know, of course, that's not going to work because we're not going to be marketed in capitalism, in the capitalism system because, you know, the, the oil industry has a best industry to keep cars running on oil. And, you know, we find, we find more oil, and, and so we keep, it's, it maybe it's cheaper sometimes. We have, depending on how much you know, we find new oil reserves, but, you know, in, in, it's going to destroy the environment. And people say, well, the oil industry, when they run out of oil, they'll, they'll be the first to uh, you know, convert to things like water cars that will not issue or alternative fuels. Well, it might be too late for the moment, which I'm you know, 100, 500 years from the oil reserves run out. So that doesn't work. Uh, that's an example of why capitalism doesn't work. Um, mass recycling, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, water desalin desalinization. The summer, I was up at uh, uh, Woodbury University saw so Sandra Postel, sort of the new Rachel Carson, um, talking because she's talking about water scarcity. And you know, her she she says that water desalinization, taking salt out of uh, seawater, is the holy grail to the world's water scarcity um, issue. But it's an expensive process, it's automatically written off, you know, so we're, we're, we're talk fears off away from the, the answer. And so I stand up and I say, well, you know, maybe you know. We thought about trying to get a new economic system so we, you know, water desalinization would have to be expensive so we could solve the problem. Yeah, well, I don't, you know, she didn't, she couldn't see that. Um, so, you know, here, you know, in this part of the country, we don't really see that water scarcity problems. We don't have that many people. We have a lot of water aquifers. But you go out west, in a place like Tucson, got all those people who immigrated from Mexico, <coughs> and you know, they're depleting their for water aquifers. So other parts of the world, in this country, in the West, it's, it's a real problem. That's an example of how capitalism, the scarce nature of it, stops problems from being solved. Uh, zero point energy from there. It's a conference this summer also in uh, Columbus. It was a presenter talking about zero point energy. Um, same concept as Buckminster well, Fuller, but basically the parts of the, the energy income from the universe. And basically there's, there's new research that there's, uh, there's more energy that hasn't been it will be measured around electrons. Uh, so there's basically saying, well, we, we, we know how to, if we spend a little bit more time, we the, the technological feasibility of basically making air, or water, or energy from air, abundance for everybody, and not burning fossil fuels as possible. And I stand up and I go, you know, well, he says, the presenter goes, uh, you know, but it would, if we did 
did that, they would throw the whole economic system which was based on oil into, into chaos, and we'd have to deal with that problem. So I stand up again and go, well, we need to think about maybe you have to a new economic system not based on uh, you know, scarcity of life, but like, you know, maybe you think about it now. Um, <laughs> but, and then finally, part the other one is, is to, here, here's one that's really, a, here's my favorite uh, missed opportunity that this that shows why capitalism is ineffective, and that is the detection and deflection of the asteroid and comet threat. People saw Armageddon, and that's, that's, that's real. We the movie Armageddon, the impact that those, those threats were real. We've always been, been hit by asteroids and comets. It's just a matter of time, we're overdue for one for one that's a mile or more wide that was the kind of sent the dinosaurs on our way. And we're the first species after the you know, to figure out how to detect the, this threat and do something about it. And, and you know, it, it's been, we have the, te uh, the technology through our nuclear weapons to basically shoot up missiles out there and deflect, explode near the asteroid comet and, and, and nudge them off course, or if they're small enough, just blow them, blow them, blow them up so that when they, work, they, when they come in, they just burn up in our atmosphere. And you know, in this century, I could go on and on about. Near misses in 1908, one example, 1908, Tunguska, Siberia, one a, a comet that came down, which just it never hit, it blew up. It was small enough to where it disintegrated in the atmosphere, but it blew up. It was a shock where it blew up the whole miles, 100 square, I mean, 100,000 square miles, I think, of, of Siberian wood. Had it been like six hours later when the Earth was rotating like this, it would have hit, you know, Europe or, uh, or Moscow, and many people would have been killed. So, but now, we're able to do something about that. But, this is the thing, with our, you know, the capitalist system is not a priority, at least not a total priority. I have a feeling that the government's probably doing something about this in secret, because they don't want to alarm us, they don't want to bring us into the fold, and, and do things together as human beings. I think it's a great opportunity to unite people, and to, and to, and to be busy creating these, these, these weapons, or to look in the skies, that's the other thing, you have to, Detection. Um, we have eyes in the sky, artists, telescope times, that we can detect these asteroids and comets. Comets come in faster. The detectors have a couple years in advance to calculate where these things come in. They do that, but that takes money. Right now, as a planet, we're only spending about $10 million, which is, you know, like the salary of a football player. We're <laughs> <laughs> part, part of the movie about asteroids and comets. You know, like, uh, that's the level. And if we spend that money actually solving the problem, and, 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 30, and 30 scientists are had fun on, on this issue around the planet, that's not good enough. And um, this, this, pathetic, this pathetic indication of capitalism, of capitalism failure. Um, and then, of course, civil aviation, sky cars. You know, in the 1950s, there was research in there. You know, the, the Jetsons type sky car, vertical takeoff. A lot back then, it was going to be noisy, but you know, we never went and researched that because, of course, the unions, which they have a right, they have to stand up for themselves because they get exploited. Because that's sort of the nature of the, uh, the musical chairs of capitalism. You know, they kind of got together and said, diverted the research funds back, you know, into the trade of cars. They have the civil aviation as a real threat. Um, current events: the WTO. And here's my take on, on Seattle in 1999. And this is, this is what I've heard. That, that there's basically a growing condemnation of global capitalism practiced by corporate conglomerates. And, it, and, and this, uh, this is being led by the labor unions and environmentalists, primarily. But I, I think we still want to have fair competition. We want to have free, free enterprise. Okay? And we also want to have a high standard of living. I talked about why we can do that with, um, with you know, pro consumption behavior, for temporary with mass recycling. Um, so, my proposal again is, not, is a global alternative to the domination by corporate, corporate conglomerates. I don't think any of us want it. I know that Ken doesn't want uh, the United, uh, United States of Earth led by Microsoft, or the United States of Microsoft. And a lot of people talk about feeling that they're simulated by Microsoft, you know, Nike, whoever they. Should be, should be in a position to exploit the people who are in, the, in less or who are out of the musical care, chairs game of, of capitalism. Um, so that's WTO. So I think my idea is fitting into 
current events. Um, someone said a couple of months ago, when they were interviewing me or someone, you know, Marty wants to change the world. I don't want to change the world. Um, I want to help change the solar system. <laughs> 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 um, I want to take the American system of government and true free enterprise, my capital, and true free enterprise, to human colonies on Mars, our own moon, and actually asteroids themselves. Some very much you do. Fill in the craters and put them up when you look there. We got to do that anyway because you know these asteroids and comets come in, people are here all, we have, have all our eggs in the same basket, so to speak. We're all here. Then when the dust cloud comes, and it will come, we're not going to be able to shoot down all in the next 500 years. There's going to be one that's going to at least you know, do it in the ditch of the dinosaurs and put a dust cloud up and shut down photosynthesis. And for two years, there'll be no life unless put people on cage and stuff. There's going to be a lot of destruction. So the best thing to do is to get some people you know, off, of, off of Earth and the space station for colonies on these other uh, worlds. That's got to be done. If you want to preserve the, the human species, you don't care about that. That's fine. There's life will replenish on Earth after that. Those patterns and colonies. Um, so since 1969, when, we land, when a human being landed on the moon, I think that a united civilization of Earth, whether it's a loose confederation or whatever, before the UN, more democratic, should have embarked on these goals decades ago, this colonization. Um, people ask me what my view is, where I put myself on the political spectrum. I think that's an important question. Uh, I consider myself a, a conservative, uh, but, but for different reasons than, than conservatives say that they're conservative. Because I have a positive view, I believe uh, in the potential for uh, self government. The government of the self. If you get the right conditions, people don't need as much government. And you know, Matt Judge, who we talked about the whole generational uh, you know, discrimination experience a lot of people my age feel discriminated against really for not getting all these ideas, but I don't, I don't get the sense that we're really being uh, invested in. Um, and if Matt Drudge, the, the uh, Drudge Report, people say he's not uh, a journalist because he doesn't have an editing process. People ask him, what's your editing process, Matt? And he goes, well, it's my conscience. He, he listed a whole bunch of uh, stories that he didn't break that would make the present look even worse. Okay? He has a conscience. And I think the rule of conscience, you can develop that. That's why, that's why I'm conservative. That I believe everybody has a conscience. And um, so that's why I'm saying on that note. A lot of liberals believe that government is needed because people are bad at exploitive corporations particularly. So they have an Asian one on humanity. A lot of conservatives, same thing. They believe, well, people are bad and the government can't stop people from being bad. They shouldn't have you know, government regulations that are being affected with which tax dollars. So that's where I'm a little bit different on that. Um, go back early, early 1992, I was here and, uh, and I saw in, in this room that came to a uh, Presentation that you posted on uh, about this report's global electric grid. That a man here by the name of Michael Kessler, a hooky by back. I actually made friends with him and get that kept contact with him throughout the years. Anyway, just to recap the, the global grid system, it's really a conventional way to achieve energy abundance in like zero point. That way you can do it for hydrogen forms of energy. But here's one way that actually, by doing it, would foster global uh, cooperation. Um, and that is basically the bearing strength between Alaska and Russia, okay, two superpowers, two former superpowers, and build, and unite the world on that, on that bridge, sink some pylons and the straight there. Then what you have is a, we have high voltage lines, electric voltage lines, and you wouldn't put people, people would say, well, that's bad right there. But the only reason that's bad is when you locate four people near high voltage electric power lines, and then there's some there's some evidence, some contradictory evidence, whether that causes cancer. So let's not even, if that is leaving a question of that, why not just not locate people there? Um, so anyway, these, this, this grid, voltage lines, would be powered by solar, wave, wind, wherever it's windy on the planet, that those turbines would feed into the grid. Wherever it's sunny on the planet, that, that power would feed into the grid. Wherever there's waterfalls, that would feed into the grid. So we would be on the same energy circuit. So that's his idea. He, he thought that 
what was it for? But they well, we could then make the, to get all those energy abundance, and now I'm on the uh, gold standard anyway at that time. You know, after the, the global currency called the kilowatt hour, which is what measures electricity. So I got thinking, I was like, well, if that's going to be abundant, everybody's going to have it. You're going to have inflation. But everybody's going to have you know, this, this kilowatt hour to really invest that stock or whatever in this system and you know, be abundant. So I said, well, why have currency at all? And then I fused that idea with my background, my educational body background in, uh, as a Montessori educator. Where you don't have grades in, um, in, in that education. You don't work for grades. You work from an internal motivation to achieve uh, uh, an end for your your community or your fellow human beings. That's what <coughs> that's what promotes you. That's what drives you to contribute. Um, so if we don't have, a, I used to think. And if we had a, uh, if we had that first, we had energy abundance first, we had automation, we do the stuff that no one wants to do, we had that thing in line first, then we could move to these kind of ideas. People always said that. All your ideas were just ahead of their time, you know, just wait until the technology comes, life is easy, and then we can move away and start thinking about moving away from money. Well, the same thing with the zero point energy. We need an economic system to be, be, to be in place so that we can, if we don't threaten certain entrenched industries. Which are only playing the game. You can't blame them. They're only playing the game the way it's meant to be played. They're sitting in their chair, fast, in the game of musical chairs. And you know, so we need more chairs, and so we can have more ideas. Um, in, in, in you know, the global grid is one because that that also is really a threat to the uh, oil industry. Okay, um, all these projects could uh, could hum in full tilt because otherwise. The oil industry is going to keep building the American public. Okay? And we're not going to move because they can make money right now off of, they know that the oil supplies that they do have, they're going to keep making money. It's simple. They're not going to do what's visionary. Some, some business people do, some people, business people are visionary, a lot of them aren't, but they do the easiest thing. <laughs> so the Montessori, back to the Montessori, will be stopped following the child. That's what the great Montessori version of the Montessori method. Um, she was a, I guess, a psychologist and, uh, and studied human development. And uh, you know, the same thing happened. I was also a Muslim at the Manioc School where they had to raise the law of education, also. You know, all these things work. And so, it's about taking the work there, to take that model and move it to the real world. Um, people said, well, how does it work? Uh, you're, there's no bar, I'm not even for bar. Because that's an exchange, that's a quid pro quo, this or that. Again, it's internal motivations. Volunteerism is the basic for following your conscience. And I like to use the smorgasbord interchange. I call it interchange as opposed to exchange. And it's the smorgasbord concept. And a good example of that feeds into a different, gives you a little better picture. For example, I believe in sort of the Shepherd model of small communities spaced out across the uh, countryside, linked by Pipelines, perhaps underground, whatever, of desalinated water. Okay. And if we do that, you can get up more organic uh, gardening, even a quarter of the time, so we can probably uh, figure out a way to do it in the greenhouse. greenhouse. So we have this sort of industrial model here towards farm. I'm all for farmers, right? I just think we should farm you know, at a, at a smaller scale so that we can manage the food better and we can get it to people. Have all these recipes. Um, you know, organic food, by the way, I'll just, I forget to mention this first. Recently, I became a, a vegan. For a vegan. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. But it's the idea that if we're going to be, and this is Edison, Thomas Edison, and uh, the other guy, Thomas Ed, Albert Einstein. The idea here is that vegetarian is not about really what's good for animals, it's about that too, but really what's good for human beings. We, we really, Dehumanize ourselves. We're still savages by eating meat, by killing animals for meat, and it's really possible. I used to think, you know, we're, um, you know, we're omnivores. We're supposed to eat meat and vegetables, but really, it's the doctor was saying we don't need uh, protein in that form. We get protein from, from soy, a lot of other different foods. Um, so there's really no ethical reason to uh, to have milk or or meat in our diet, and we've got meat, you know. Other 
others talk that I understand the point you said um, you know, we are tempering to be more peaceful and even I think there's a policy to do that. It's not an expert in metaphysics or anything, but that's something to consider. But anyway, we have these vegetarian wonderful meals and people trying to outcook themselves. And you know, people coming to different sports boards and that would be helpful competition. That's the right there. Who who can make the best meal get the most applause, you know, for their meal? And that's you know and, that, and the same with building cars, like I, I use a car example. Building cars and uh, you know, everybody can pick up a couple cars for so, uh, a month or whatever, drive them around, fill out a questionnaire, recycle the cars back, you know, recycle back the cars, and then um, the engineers go back to building better, safer cars. But the same with the fish turns and food. Um, so that, I hope that gives you a little bit of a picture of what it would look like. And there would be no exchange. People would just come up, line up, and get and basically come to the depot and just pick up what they want. What they want, not what they need, what they want. And need what they want because it's free enterprise about people wanting to provide, you know, get, get appreciation from their peers. Now, some, someone uh, said, well, that's still a negative motivation to want to get. That's not internal, but you're, you're contradicting yourself because you're trying to we're still working for other people, and that's not internal. And, and that's, I appreciate that, that challenge. But I still think. I don't, I, I don't want to agree with that. I, I think it's good to want to be appreciated by others. And I think it's good to give people applause and give people um, recognition for their efforts. And, uh, but it, it's, it's still a good, good argument for why it would work to, to the people who believe it wouldn't work because you just take that you know, it's true that people want to be appreciated. And that's what would that's what keep quality and Christian services up. Um, Uh, automation, automation. Who would who, who would dig the dishes? That, that's all I know. Well, it'd be if we could automate a lot of these tasks, toilet and whatever people don't want to do, or speed human beings. Um, or, and also we got to factor this in. There's a lot of jobs where there, that there would be you might maybe couldn't automate like laying sewer lines on different planets or whatever. It would be a chance to serve because you can get figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life anyway. Just go and dig a ditch for a while, have some camaraderie. And, um, or for people who are in between careers, making that lateral career shift, don't know what to do, go get some exercise and do something. <laughs> Lay a pipeline, or you sound like a lot of I think you think can, can make that case. But you can't have these things people doing this for the rest of their lives. Um, well, so the, the idea is basically have a general retirement. And people would travel, find themselves to the moon or Europe or whatever, whatever, and they come and return to volunteers. The people who are lucky enough to make the capital of the system to retire, a lot of them, my grandparents would go, on, go back and volunteer their time. Okay. So it does work. You just have to build on what, what it works. Now, education gives some old ideas of education. Let me just try this out. And, and I, I realize I'm in the, the town of Forest Man. In our and I think these ideas would fit, fit in because I've been influenced by those, those, those two things. I just do their lives and give me directly. Have libraries educate, give more of a, uh, a general education up to say like age 10 or 12, 16, wherever we define a real adult. I think that has to be redefined too. I think when you see it in schools, people uh, rebelling against being treated like kids in, in our schools, it's called ages. That's another thing you've got, you got to think about ages. So they have libraries. Librarians are one of the teachers because they teach people how to teach themselves. And that's, that's very that's very Montessori. So have them introduce kids to all these different um, you know, subjects. Because right now, schools and universities, even Montessori, I, mean, I don't think really fit. What I think is the goal, the primary model of education is Plato's Academy. Okay. Small classes, the Socratic method. A real dialogue, real leadership can be do that in all disciplines. You could know, actually have a universal apprenticeship. The problem with the apprenticeship with the guild system in Europe was that it was exclusive. If you wanted to be a glass blower, you had to know a glass blower. In this system, if you want to be a glass blower, you, you, know, you can do it. Anybody can do it. You should be able to do it. Now, I'll finish with a, the, the biggest and boldest idea, which I think is the United States or the bioregion of Earth. And the reason I've come to the reason I'm a world federalist is, is because 
I believe that is how we can fulfill the American experiment in Republican democracy. Look at, look at the Gettysburg Address, which is the first major test of that experiment in democracy. Lincoln talks about how to discover, will this civil war make us miss, make humanity miss the chance to have this form of Republican democracy? Well, is it going to flourish for the earth? That's the last word you gave for address first. He wrote the thing from many one. That's what war medals is meant, from many one. It's American. And since 1969, due to the efforts of Americans, Beginning with Russia, I'll be I think we, we see, they're perceived to become foreigners. Bob Cole says we, we don't want to put our troops under foreign command. I agree with you. But we shouldn't look at people in other countries as foreigners. We should look at them as human beings. So we can you know, achieve things in space and we can actually prevent the destruction of the human race. Uh, but there's clearly the, the, the UN Security Council is not democratic. It's, it's basically, I, I like it to the old the British House of Lords. It's undemocratic. There's no way that, I, that we should be a part of the organization. We're part of those five member nations that basically have veto power over all these other, other cultures. Namely, Islam. How, how can we alienate the whole Islamic world by not doing them in the Security Council? And if we're even going to have the Security Council, it's just not good to you about the politics. Even if you, even if you uh, believe in, in the balance of power um, concept, where you believe that keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Um, so that has to be changed. And, and I think the United States of Earth would do it. And I think it would be something an option that people like Patrick Kennedy would, would latch on to because the alternative is the United States of Microsoft. We should, planetary peace. And I'll finish with this. Planetary peace should be achieved because or should occur not because of the balance of power or, because, or even with, with the gun control or even with um, or even with uh, uh, you know, global arms treaties or broadhounds, comprehensive truck testing treaties. That's not going to do it. If you're still going to have a balance of power, we need international cooperation. We, we need to be too busy working together on the detection and deflection of asteroids. The economy, the actual economy threat to, to worry about who's going to take over what little pity or order to get and control oil, messing up our environment in, our, in, the, in the future of our species anyway. Um, we should be too busy rehabilitating wildlife ranges so that we have, we have it the way it was, and to constantly live in this, in this great land. Um, We'd be too busy building small spaced out Jeffersonian villages that are connected by sky cars. That way, the sky cars go over nature. And also, I mentioned the pipelines that keeps out of the water. So that's, that's my vision. And um, I'd be willing to uh, entertain questions. Thank you. Just take a look at these couple of these slides um, that talk about synergistic power and just realize that the abundance based economic component of that is what al would allow synergistic power uh, to be exercised. So I really think that the uh, the the interchange economics is the primary idea that I, that I, I want to address. That's why I wanted to give this this fuller um, articulation of it uh, from a while back, and to show that I've I've been thinking about this. And in fact, I gave a lot of talks um, on this to other Unitarian uh, fellowships, um, going and and public libraries, these public presentations going back to 1996. So this was kind of the period between 1996 and 1999 um, uh, was where I refined and, and, and talked this out.